Hi, Tom. Josie, hi. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you. Do you, first of all, um, is Josie okay? Is that how you like to be called? Absolutely fine. Yes, Josephine yeah. tends to be when I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm Tom and I'm Thomas when I'm in trouble. But, okay. um, only for my parents. Um, so, yeah, so to set the scene then, um, where, who are you, where are you calling from? Give us a bit of background. Uh, so I'm Josie. I'm a sports psychologist. I live in West London, Chiswick. Um, so I have a clinic here um, and then I work with athletes, performers, actors, lots of doctors um, all around the world. The uh, I must admit, um, hands up. I um, I'm actually off, I'm supposed to be off on paternity leave at the minute, um, and thus I haven't been working, obviously, and thus I haven't done much background research. Now that might either help this podcast or hinder this podcast. Um, but in the last couple of days, I've I've kind of been you know doing a lot of googling, looking on your website. And I've I've noticed actually that there's, there's already been a, a few podcasts that you've that you've started. Um, you've done a lot of um, kind of magazine articles as well, um, and a lot in on in sporting realm and in cycling as well. So um, really looking forward to this talk. Um, and um, and yeah, I mean, looking at your website, it seems like you. Well, first of all, you're a very busy person. Um, where does like where is most of your time spent then would you say obviously i'm looking at your website and would you say the the kind of one to one sports psychology is something that you do mostly or um i guess my days are split um, and like you i have a, a child so um sports psychology is actually amazing for being able to be flexible with being able to do drop offs and pick ups of school and the myriad of classes that they have after school and all the other stuff. So it's actually very lucky that I can work in the evenings when people need to actually be able to speak one to one with somebody. And I get that time off to school that I get to hang out with her. Um, so I guess I tend to see about 12 to 15 clients a week, one to one. I um, usually do one or two workshops a week with usually in schools or sports clubs. Um, every couple of weeks I'll do kind of a keynote speech around the sports psychology subject. Um, and then I, I love writing. I've written five books um, and obviously do lots of articles and stuff. And then I'm also an associate lecturer at the Open University. So that's probably about one day of time a week where we do tutorials and I, I talk with the, the students in my tutor groups um, about sports psychology. Brilliant. Wow. So from a professional standpoint, then um, you're a, a chartered member of the British Psychological Society and a member of the Association of Applied Sports Psychologists. Um, and working with those in sport and on the stage and in business um, to help them overcome their barriers to success so they can achieve their goals. That was taken straight off your website. <laughs> um, so that's the kind of yeah professional side then. So what do you do? Give us a little bit of background um, from a sports perspective personally then. So, um, you know, obviously, usually if you've got um, a... Uh, if your job is somewhat involved in sport, usually you have a little bit of background in sport yourself and, and you can kind of link the two. What do you do yourself? Um, so it's, it's odd. I still don't think of myself as sporty. I was right. absolutely that kid in the school changing rooms that was always last out of the changing rooms and did <laughs> clinging onto the radiator not to have to go and play hockey in the freezing cold. Um, so I don't think of myself as sporty. Um, and actually as a kid, I was a dance school brat so I was ballet tap modern jazz drama all of that till I was 18 um and then I rode at university um and then gosh almost 20 years ago um a friend did one of those race for life races and asked if I'd do it with her and I did the 5k and then I did a 10k and then I signed up for a marathon um and then I was like, well, if there's a marathon, then what's after that one? So, of course, I signed up for triathlon and ended up doing Ironman. Um, and so I did all of that alongside 
a grown up job. I was a communications director in the city um, until 2013. And then I went over to Melbourne to do Ironman Melbourne. And um, the, the race starts in a place called Frankston, which normally has this beautiful beach that's nice and calm, except on the morning we did this race. And it was horrific. And I was totally terrified. Wow. And um, and my, my husband's an Aussie and even he was a bit terrified. So I was like, oh, these waves are bad. Um, and the guy in the tannoy said, you can't change those waves, guys. You can only change how you feel about them. And it sounds so cheesy, but it was like proper light bulb moment of, oh, yeah. If I actually used my brain, and I'd always been the geeky academic one at school, so my brain was okay. It was my mm. sports that were rubbish. I was like, if I used my brain a bit better, I might be able to do better at this sporty stuff. Um, so I did get in the water and I did do that race, and it's actually my fastest Ironman to date. Wow. Um, and I can't imagine doing another one, so it will be the fastest. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, when I got back to the UK, I started looking at sports psychology, and there weren't many books around it at the time. I think Chimp Paradox had probably just about come out and that was all that was really talked about. Mm. Um, and I wasn't having a great time at work. So I quit my job. I went back to university and I did a conversion course into psychology. And then I discovered you have to do another master's in sport and exercise psychology. And then I discovered, because I hadn't researched this at all, that you had to do three years of supervised practice um, to actually become a sports psychologist. So it was a five-year process to kind of totally retrain. Um, but yeah. but works, thank goodness. Maybe not if I'd have actually researched properly. Um, <laughs> kind of, not, oh, another three years coming up. Um, it, it all kind of fell into place eventually. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting what you said about the conditions in that that triathlon there. Um, I link it back to myself. I, I um, it's funny where like as a as a child or as a teenager whenever I used to race my bike in kind of wet conditions, um, you know, I think as everyone does to a certain extent, you know, kind of um, a few sulky faces around and thinking, oh, you know, it's really sketchy, I'm cold and whatnot. Um, and then one day, slightly different to your experience, but one day I, I just had a, a really good race in in wet conditions and I, and I felt fantastic. And, uh, and ever since that day, um, whenever it rains in a race i just it's a completely different it's a different approach to the psychology behind it i'm, I'm really positive going into yeah. them now and uh, the sensation of the rain bouncing on my legs it, it it just immediately kind of um makes this whole kind of positive uh positive mindset um it's brilliant um but yeah no that's a really interesting way of coming into it and um and as you say, I mean, it sounds like you're really invested in generally individual sports, and and so am I. Um, would you say then that uh, the job in in as a sports psychologist has helped your own sports psychology going along the way as well? Or I don't know. I do remember when I first started running. So before I'd ever even heard of sports psychology, I decided just as you were talking about the rain there and a wet weather cycling, I decided that because I really hated going up hills and I always had this real block about, oh, no, it's a hill, I was going to love hills. Mm. And I, I didn't even know about sports psychology, but I used this thing of I would see a hill and I'd be like, I love hills, I love hills, I love hills. It's exactly kind of um, instructional self-talk that we'd use right now. Um, and actually, it worked. I, I see hills and I'm like, brilliant, I'm good at hills. Um, and so I think some of the techniques can be brilliant. Um, I did London Marathon a couple of weeks ago mm. and it was it was not it was a brilliant day. Atmosphere enjoyment wise, it was not a good running day. My legs had right. not decided to get on the train to Blackheath with me um, and my chest certainly hadn't. I was I was really struggling with asthma, not very far in. Um, and but it was London Marathon. It's my favourite race. My husband and daughter were there watching. I'd been talking about it so much on social media and the build up and giving out techniques. I was like, I cannot not finish. Yeah, yeah. That is not a question. I have to finish this. Um, and I used every single tool in my toolbox. Yeah. And I finished, but not in a time that I'm proud of. Mm. And 
it's not the nicest of memories about it. Mm. So I think you can absolutely, yes, many of them are incredibly powerful to use and they work. Um, but it is very hard to do them on yourself because I know the mechanics behind them. I know I'm doing this for X, Y, or Z. And it, I think that's harder than if, you've worked on something with somebody and you go off with that being your kind of mm. approach that you're going to use. Um, mm. And I do see the approaches working amazingly. I was thinking the other day, I love Sunday afternoons because Sunday afternoons are where I scroll through Instagram and I see everybody I've worked with mm. and how they've done in their races that day. Or, or you start getting the messages back through with thank mm. yous and stuff. And it's like, that's my, and you must get that as a coach. Yeah, absolutely, it's, my, yeah. it's my favorite moment. Um, and you also get to do the debriefs where something hasn't gone well with somebody mm. and it's like, okay, well, let's take that into our next session. What can we work mm. on on that? What do we learn from it? Um, but, but that's the feedback bit. So you see that some of the techniques can work really, really well. Um, but it, I think it's really hard to do on yourself. And I bet you have to, uh, often if someone does have, um, a, a not so good race, um, in their, from their own perspective, you, as a sports psychologist, you you probably have to jump in there quite quick and 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 start that feedback loop quite quickly because otherwise, I, I can only assume that people kind of get into this negative spiral and it, and it becomes harder to get get out. Is that right? Would you say? Yeah. So what I tend to give um, my athletes, uh, we call them performance postcards. So on the front is everything you need to put into the race and think about like your strengths, um, your sessions you've done in the build up, the instructional mantra, the motivational mantra, your goal. That's the front. The back is what you do afterwards. And that's the oh, analysis. Wow. Mm. Um, and it, it becomes quite handy. You've got one postcard that covers that race. And yeah. so you've got things to look back and you build up a collection of them and you can really learn from them that way. Um, I always say don't do the analysis, though immediately afterwards because right. there are too many emotions involved and yeah. we're almost too close to be able to see the big picture so i haven't actually done a reflection of london marathon even though was it two weeks ago hmm. yet have because, the legs recovered yet oh the legs are fine then i got the illness that you always get oh, yeah when your immunity shot um and then i had the post-race blues and now i need to find a goal and then okay. I'll be fine. Yeah. Um, but I haven't actually done that analysis yet because it felt still too raw and mm. still too a bit bitter about it um, and frustrated. So, often, as a, often as a coach, whether whether it be a race or a training session, um, I always say to my athletes, give me feedback roughly uh, 24 hours after. Um, yeah. and, and, and I mean, obviously it's different for, for different type of things, but often if someone's just finished a training session and it and it hasn't gone their way yeah you get all the, the emotions straight after you know that the, there's sometimes been swearing there's been you know bringing in all sorts of different emotions um but then when you kind of when they calm that down a little bit then you get the the actual critical feedback and uh, having a bit of time to kind of look at it in a different perspective is is always best totally um, yeah but, so yeah um, 24 hours to 48 hours later and, and the thing I think that's helpful with, if it hasn't gone well, it's very easy to give loads of these are all the things I messed up. Mm. And it's very hard to find that actually this stuff went really well. And there will always be good stuff. Mm. Um, and I like people to have an equal amount of feedback in each. So even if you, I know, you won your age category and you qualified for a world champs, there's still going to be stuff that wasn't brilliant and that you do mm. need to learn from. So it helps us then feel like each race isn't just an individual race, but it's part of your journey to get to wherever you want to get to. Mm. And, and so we should be learning from every single event that we do and every training session we do rather than just classifying it as good or bad and kind of putting Absolutely. it to the side. Sports psychology is something that I'm, um, something that I'm really coming, like starting to learn a little bit more about um, in, in the past coming years. And, it's really like coming more to the forefront of my mind in terms of the influence it's had on, has on sports performance. Um, and again, just like, you know, linking it to myself, I've had some incredibly low moments in sport performance before. Um, and it's when I, my mind has been at its, its weakest and I've not had good kind of approaches going into races. There's races I can think of where, um, you know, for example, I, I'm not getting the result that I thought I would be going into it. Um, and 
then I come up with excuses as to um, what might be going on. And I've even um, pretended to have a puncture before in a race just so that I could um, show everyone else that, oh, that was the reason for the misperformance and nothing else. Even though finishing the race would have been fine and would have been, you know, I should have been proud of it because I rode in certain conditions, whatever it might be, because I wasn't getting the place, the positioning that I what I should have been doing or that I thought I was expected to get. Suddenly, my mind just goes to pot, and and uh, it's something that I am learning from, and it's something that um, I think I'm getting better at over, over the years to come. Um, Having a child helps. I think that gives you a lot of perspective on certain things. So it? does. And it's so, <laughs> so... So I find that fascinating, the pretending to have a puncture. Mm. Um, and it's not... That's quite dramatic. But it's not yeah. unusual at all in that our, our brains love an excuse. Mm. Um, and often the way I describe that part of our brain, the threat part of our brain, that's constantly looking for excuses to to get us out of difficult, tricky things. It's just like having a toddler. <laughs> so if you're still on paternity leave, you haven't, I'm guessing you haven't got to toddler stage yet. No, no, no. Well, well I've got two. One of them is two two years old. Oh, so then they, you're they, have... are in, they are in peak uh, tantrum. Yeah. State. And then um, the other one is only a couple of weeks old. So. Oh, bless. Brilliant. <laughs> um, so, yes, with the, the tantrum toddler, that's what your brain I, I think of my brain sometimes when it's going down that route. It's literally, it's like a toddler having a tantrum. Mm. There is no logic attached to things because when you're having that tantrum in your head, you cannot access the part of your brain that focuses on logic. You mm. can, you, what you're accessing is the amygdala and the amygdala is just like a toddler having a tantrum. Mm. And it will do, your amygdala wants you to be safe. It is desperate to feel safe and secure. It wants you to survive. And when you go out doing difficult things, like cycling in the rain, or you've set yourself a difficult psychological goal, like a place, which is totally uncontrollable, mm. because you've got no idea who else is going to rock up or mm. in our sport who's doping or whatever else is going on. So you've set yourself an impossible goal that is actually pretty irrelevant, because where you place doesn't really mean that much as to how you're doing, because it depends on everybody else. Um, and so your your amygdala hates that sort of goal because there's a you can't control it anyway, but there's also quite a high chance you might not reach it. And it will do everything it can to give you lots of excuses as to why you shouldn't do it. Mm. Those it's excuses like, make it so much harder to actually do it, but they'll oh, yeah. all be there. Yeah, the, the, the with the with the toddler, um it's often like there's always something that triggered the tantrum initially, but then five minutes later they've they've kind of forgotten what that trigger was or what the problem was, but they're they're, they're so in this kind of black hole of, of of the situation that they just keep going, don't they? Um, and, I, and I, I remember, show. yeah, I remember sandwiches being cut in the wrong shape, <laughs> using a green plate instead of a pink one, and yeah. but in their heads right then. There was something about that pink plate that mm. made them feel safe. Yeah, yeah. And or mm. having a triangle rather than a square made them feel mm. safe. And so if we can think that that's the part of our brain, the amygdala, the threat zone, wants us to stay safe. Mm. And if we're doing something that takes us outside our comfort zone, and bike races can be pretty scary for that. You've mm. got kind of groups of people, you're going fast, you've got downhills, you've got cornering, you see crashes. We all know how painful it can be when we've crashed your amygdala is going to do loads of stuff to give you excuses mm. and get out clauses. oh yeah it's like, turn up to a race with all the confidence in the world and then you see someone up, oh no so and so's turn up oh that's it now i might as well not bother racing you know throw yeah. the, the toy comes out the pram i might as well pack up and go home or immediately you, you're not racing up to the same kind of standard because this so and so is here whatever it might be yeah um Josie, you, amongst all other things you've mentioned already, you write books. Um, I mean, hats off to you. I mean, I I can't understand how anyone as busy as you can find the time to do that, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but um, yeah, credit to you. I mean, so your latest book is what we're going to be talking about a little bit today, which is The Ten Pillars of Success. Um, so first of all, why did you write this book and who is it aimed at? Um, so I I wrote it because 
I guess the, the luxury and joy of my job is that I hopefully get to see more of the real side of people than many other people get to see of them. And that really fascinates me to what is it that really makes us who we are? And part of my job then is trying to get out that authentic side of a person so that they can put more of who they really are into their sports and they can use their values more and their purpose and things. So there's that side of like revealing the real side of people. But there's also that side, I guess, because I have a slightly academic background as well, of really trying to understand what are those traits and those characteristics that we have that can help us be really successful because when I've got more of that knowledge I can help my clients better um and so I was really really reflecting on this and then in 2020 um I was working on a podcast with Mari Yamaguchi the amazing marathon runner and at Middleton and we were taking five London marathon runners who were doing their first London marathon and we were doing lots of work physical stuff but also psychological stuff to get them to enjoy and to do their first London marathon and it was brilliant and we did it for audible it was fabulous and and then the pandemic hit and London marathon didn't happen and everything stopped and and we kind of did some kind of closing finishing things with this group um, but it was like, oh, that was that was it. Mm. Um, but it, it had some really lovely feedback on Audible. Um, and lots of people had really liked a lot of the techniques that I'd, I'd helped. And so I ended up talking to Audible about, is there something we could do? And um, this was obviously then mid-pandemic. So it was actually a really nice time to be able to, there's not much sports psychology going on mid-pandemic. Mm. Um, so it was a really good time to be able to kind of really explore this. And so I was like, what would be brilliant, what I would love to do is look at kind of 10 really key characteristics or traits that help us be successful in life and properly research them, really understand. It's not just someone sticking their top 10 up on Twitter. It's like, mm. this has all of the academic background and vast amounts of research show why these are so powerful. Mm -hmm. and use somebody vaguely famous, somebody, people we might know and recognize to show how they live that pillar, how mm -hmm. they bring it to life and how it's helped them be successful. Um, so it's kind of half podcast, half book at the time because it was purely for Audible. And so it was with all this background research, but then I got to pick 10 people. It was amazing, like people mm -hmm. you've always wanted to go and chat to. And I get to pick them for my book to go and chat to and to show how they live that pillar and how it brings to life everything in that research. Um, Brilliant. Wow. So that came so, out 21. Um, and then there was lots of feedback from it of like, this is great, but how do I use all the tools when there's no way to write them down? Yeah. Um, so so we did, you, to a book. did you interview all of these um, individuals in, in quite a lot of depth then and, and kind of bring, bring these answers out of them kind of thing? Or Yeah, so we had... We probably had about an hour and a half, two hours with each wow. um, with each individual. And it was still during lockdown, so we couldn't be in a studio together, which yeah. I was a bit gutted about because I'd love to have met some of these people. Um, but but it was really realistic. I, I always remember the bit where um, we interviewed Sarah Pascoe, the comedian who I mm. love. And she was awesome. She talked all about, um, oh, what was her? Internal Insight. Because as okay. a comedian, you have to like scan yourself so much. You have to know yourself inside out to be able to make yourself funny. Um, and so, and lots of the way through, her dog was chewing its toy. And it was just like, it was so authentic mm. because it's like she's talking about her life in the middle of her life. It wasn't in mm. some kind of clinical type studio. Um, so, um, so, yeah, it, it was fascinating to, to find people you really admire. Mm. And you admire them for something in particular. So um, Dame Kelly Holmes talked about belonging. And, and she's got a fascinating background where she spent some time in foster care, but where mm. she was able to get reunited with her mum and where she's belonged in different places, like in a GB team or in the army. Um, and how, when she didn't belong, how that really caused her her depression where she would self-harm she had these amazing stories that just really brought to life wow. how important belonging is um so um would you say these traits then um so first of all would you say that any successful athlete or person does um 
does have all 10 of these traits then? No. No, no okay. I can't imagine anyone has all of those traits. Right. Um, and you don't, you don't need all, I mean, it'd be amazing. Um, but I think they're more of a, these are things we can work towards in our lives. Mm. And, and I think most people probably have one or two. Mm-hmm. And you can, if you think about it like that, you start to think about that as your superpower. Yeah. I've, That's um, good. Cause I was reading through them and I was thinking, well, I've got a little bit of that. I've got a little bit of that. I definitely don't have that. And then so, so I was trying to think, totally. okay, is this something I need to work on? And, 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 and I guess on secondly to that, then are these, are these pillars or are these traits, something that you're generally born with, with, you know, for nature or is something that you, that typically comes with a lot of practice and, and learned behavior? both and that's what I've tried to pull together with them that they some of us will be lucky enough to be born with certain traits particularly things like confidence some Mm -hmm. people do just ooze confidence Mm -hmm. most of us don't most of us have to proactively work on it and so in each chapter there are tools there's a toolkit at the end of each chapter with his four, five, six different techniques you can use to grow your confidence, to become more courageous, to build your gratitude. Um, So it is very specifically designed that it's lovely if you were born with this. Hurrah for you, you are flying. Most of us probably need to work on it. Mm. Um, And I think the people, most of the people picked and used in it probably have that trait because they've used it so much they they are almost known for that it is within them um lucy gossage is amazing i used to race against her in cycling time trials um obviously a long way back she's amazing Mm. um so she's um she for a a while was a pro ironman athlete she took Mm. sabbatical from her job as an oncologist um so day-to-day she's an oncology consultant but she still goes off and does amazing adventures um And she was the chapter on gratitude. And when I was sitting there thinking about each chapter, she was instantly, that's who I want. Because every time I've spoken to her and everything I've seen from her, gratitude just feels like it's built into who she is. Mm -hmm. And that was, there are absolutely techniques we used to be more thankful for the things we have in our lives. And they're very powerful and they help our help us in so many ways with being happier and being more productive and make any more money and everything from them. Mm. Um, but it, it can definitely be easier if you just have that thankful attitude towards mm. life. If you can go into any situation and you put that spin on it. She talked about when she was training for Ironman, she'd finish work. It would be eight o'clock at night and she'd have to run around the ring roads of Nor- um, Nottingham where she lived um to get her long run in and it'd be like freezing cold torrentially rain she's on ring roads because it's the only place that's got any lighting yeah and many of us would just be almost sulking or not most people wouldn't go and do it but if you're doing it many of us would be sulking about it Mm. and she's like i've had teenagers in my clinic today that aren't going to survive i they would love to be doing this i am just so thankful that my body works well enough to give me the opportunity to do this run Mm. and and that is also uh, again not we're going to link everything to parenthood but that's something that i feel like i've got a lot more of since being a parent um gratitude and and uh just uh being thankful of what what we can do with our bodies um so you know many many years ago before i had children you know the the thought of uh going out right now i mean all i can realistically squeeze in especially when i've got a couple of week old ch- uh, child with a wife who has had a c section as well so i'm having to kind of help her out is um you know squeeze in little training sessions here or there you know the odd 40 minute run the odd little little turbo session and whatnot um and you know it's very if i look back kind of four years ago i'd look at that and think that must be awful like you know i was used to doing four or five hour rides all the time in the world and and so on um whereas now you know it's it's almost like okay well i'm i'm thankful that my body can do that i'm thankful that i can still lift this weight and i'm finding a lot of um a lot of peace and a lot of like extra enjoyment out of the simple pleasures in life you know being able to go for a run being able to go for a run in the sunshine at seven o'clock in the morning in the fresh air is just just amazing just 
filling my lungs with all that nice fresh oxygen and so on. Um, you know, like I say, it's all perspective, I guess. Totally. And, and I'd also say as your children get older, when you get to see them discover sport and discover what their bodies can do, that's, that brings so much joy. And I never, I didn't, I wasn't maternal and I don't think I'm particularly a kind of particularly kind person in that way. And yet when I see my daughter achieve something, hmm. oh my goodness, the joy, the, I took her swimming yesterday and um, she's so comfortable in the water and she was down the deep end the whole time <laughs> and she was diving in and then she got a bit scared and she stood there and she said, she, did, she kind of ran her hands down her body and she went, I'm ready. And then she did this beautiful dive in. I was just like, oh, my God. I was like, have you been listening to me telling about, like, self-talk? She went, oh, no. It's I was just like, whoa, look at this. And she's like, oh, no, it's a book we read at school um, yeah. called Jamil Jumps or something. But it was so amazing to see that she was learning independently and she was putting it into her sport and she was just loving seeing what her body could do. And then you go for a run and you get grumpy because you were 30 seconds slower than last week. And you're like, oh, my God, that stuff's so irrelevant. Okay, so let's get into these 10 pillars then. Um, I'm mindful of time. So um, if we kind of just run through them, um, I'll introduce the, the, the pillar and give Wikipedia's definition of it, I guess. And then if you can kind of um, give a bit of kind of reasoning as to why this is important for a high performer and um, the, the rele relevance that it plays, I guess. Okay. So yep. um, the first one you've um, suggested is a sense of belonging. Um, so belong belongingness, and please correct me if I'm wrong in terms of how I'm kind of explain the terminology but belongingness is the human emotion need to be be accepted member of a group kind of yeah um i guess the reason the first three are there actually we kind of cover all these together even though they're yeah. very different is that this is very geeky i have a favorite theory in sports psychology and it's called self-determination theory and it's the idea that there are three types of motivation. There's a motivation, cannot be bothered. I would rather sit on the sofa with a cup of tea. There is extrinsic motivation, which is what most elite athletes are going to be motivated by. It's outside of themselves. They are doing it for a reason that's external, mm -hmm. to be paid well, to win a medal, to get a sponsorship, to get well known enough that they can do the media work they want to do afterwards. And there is intrinsic motivation. And I kind of see that as a bit of the holy grail, that we, yeah. want, we want to do something because we love it, not because we're fast or we're going to win stuff or we beat people, but we do it because we love that feeling of it. And that's why I'll spend a lot of time trying to help non-exercisers when I work with them find the thing they love. Because when, you just, when you're excited to do it, when your alarm goes at 6.15, because the pool opens at 6 30 you actually get out of bed rather than just snooze it because you're like oh, I love that feeling of being in the pool and flowing through the water whatever your thing is and the theory says there are three pillars that you need in order to get that sense of intrinsic motivation and that is belonging so feeling part of the bigger group feeling like not just that you fit in it's more than fitting in because fitting in is trying to squish yourself into somebody else's box. Belonging is just being accepted for who you are and valued for who you are by others. I see. So there's belonging. There's autonomy. Having a choice and a voice over what you do and how you do it. And that one is much easier for us to get as adults. But I work a lot with teenagers. And they really struggle with that because their time, they're told where to be, what time to do, how to do everything. They can't drive themselves anywhere because they're not old enough yet. They still have rules at home. That's really hard. How do you make it your own when you've got so many barriers around what you do? Um, and the, the final pillar there is um, mastery, doing things really, really well. No mm -hmm. one wants to go and make a prat of themselves um, the big thing I hear from anyone starting out is I don't want to be last. 
I don't want everyone laughing at me or looking at me knowing I'm last. That's that real fear. And it stops us doing other things. It stops people going to the gym to do core sessions or weightlifting or things because it feels scary and we don't know what we're doing. Autonomy is um, a big one, actually. With with cycling, I think, on, on sport in general, like it, it's very easy, easy to be um governed by what everyone else is doing the likes of like strava and so on you know you you, you're doing your own thing you are um kind of training on on what would be an appropriate training plan and you feel like you're progressing well um but then you're seeing what everyone else is doing on strava and they're you know doing twice as many miles as you might be or whatever it might be and um to be influenced by that and then suddenly think you're not doing enough is um is is one of the biggest uh, impact on your own your own performance and comparison is always you know as we say that the thief of joy and comparing against what others are doing that may work well for them but it might not work for you yes i um i advise people not to use anything like strava mm-hmm. um i just find it brings far more harm than you're ever going to get good out of it um interestingly i did find in the research for this the when we are feeling envy at the other end of envy is gratitude and our brains cannot feel envious at the same time they are feeling thankful so if you catch yourself scrolling through strava going oh but they went further or they went faster or they've got this finding something to be thankful for yourself Mm. is really helpful Mm. because you can't do both at the same time so anytime you find envy look at it about well what can i do what can I, what have I got? What's come this way? It's a really nice one. Mm. Yeah. So, so those are the first three chapters based on this theory of when we have autonomy, when we feel like we really belong and when we are masterful at what we do, we are so much happier. Mm. And, and, and we can then very specifically, if we're like, I don't feel like I'm masterful, I don't feel competent at it. Right, I'll give somebody what I call a skill sheet 10 skills in your sport that will make you feel much more competent. And Mm -hmm. so that could be um, descending. It could be cornering in a bunch. It could be um, being able to hit 250 watts for X amount of time, whatever things they are for that individual. But then you go away and you really proactively work on them. There's no excuses when you're actively looking at the, I need to do this. I need to tick this off. And you've, by the end of that, if you have 10 things and know five little boxes to tick each time you've done it, you've got 50 pieces of evidence that you're much more masterful at what you do. You've got the skills, you've got the competency. And is, is there any other pillars which are grouped together by a certain theory of psychology, would you say, or not? No, that those three, I think, drive a huge amount. And if somebody... Good example now. Lots of us who did spring marathons, Mm -hmm. legs have recovered. You've got over the immunity issues of whatever cold or bugs you've got. You've got over the dip and then it's like, oh, what's next? And that can be races, but actually often it's just general motivation has dipped because you've worked for something for so long. And then it's like, oh. Um, And so I will really go through with those pillars of like, right, think about your belonging. What did you enjoy about it? Was it that you trained with a club? Was it you were on a WhatsApp group of loads of you all doing the same race and now you're kind of missing that excitement that you have? Is it that you really enjoyed ticking off your five runs a week and seeing that you were hitting X speed? Well, what kind of mastery can we give you for whatever you want to do next? Mm -hmm. And it needs to be your choice. It's one of the big things I think is hard about cycling is as as a kid and a teen, you're really good. You get really, really good, and it's all your autonomy, and it's your freedom, isn't it? Bike, there's nothing that says freedom to me even more than being on a bike. Um, so you get loads of autonomy, and then you join a pro racing team. There's no autonomy. You don't even get to choose which bike you ride because that's mm. given to you because it's what sponsorship you've got. You don't get to choose what nutrition you have. Again, that's sponsorship. You don't get to choose your races. You don't get to choose how you behave in those races. Um. When I've spoken to people like Steve Cummings at Ineos about kind of how he looks after the athletes when he's working as a DS, one of his things is how do I give them more autonomy? How do I let them choose that bit? Because it's so helpful to their performance. 
but in most kind of teams that's really tricky um so those three they get grouped together a lot but I think they're so helpful if you're struggling with motivation to go and look at them of like how do I get more belonging how do I increase my autonomy how do I feel more competent you'll you'll find some route out of that kind of malaise purpose um a person's sense of resolve or determination how does this fit into the the pillars uh i would say it's deeper than that description actually okay i in the book i talk about this as well there's a, a japanese phrase called agaki and it's kind of it's the idea that when you're 80 and you're rocking chair you can look back at your life and it was worth you being here mm -hmm. the idea it takes the fear away from death because you've left something valuable behind and i think that's purpose much more than just the effort you put into something mm -hmm. so but when you have your purpose you will put much more effort into whatever it is that leads you towards that purpose mm -hmm. um so the the case study we use in the book is damien hall who is an ultra runner and um he talks about when he was doing the Pennine Way. So he did this at the end of, I think, the first lockdown, so 2020. And his one of his best mates was also going for the world record to run the Pennine Way, which is 268 miles, I think, down kind of the heart of England. And his friend was going for it a week before him. And they knew the time. I think it was something like 61 hours that they had to beat. And... um. And his purpose drove him and his, his purpose in life. He's a green runner. He talks a lot about um, Extinction Rebellion kind of things. He's absolutely passionate about how does he be a great role model for treading as lightly as possible on this earth as a runner. And so he really incorporated that into his, his record attempt. He put people off coming to watch and cheer because he didn't want them driving there. Um, he asked his pacers to pick up litter along the way, so they left mm -hmm. it better. He ate vegan food. He used compostable wrappings for the food that he ate. He had FFF written down his arm in great big letters, um, stood for friends, family, and the future. And he had, a, and as, as he wanted to be able to talk in the media afterwards when he achieved this record about why it's important that we do more for the environment. Mm -hmm. And he did, finished it, went on BBC Breakfast, got to talk about what was important to him in a different way than people would have heard it before. So those moments when you're totally, totally exhausted, it's two and a half days of nonstop running, and your brain just wants you to sit down and have a nice rest. If you know why you are doing it, you can push yourself beyond anything you thought was possible. So for the... For the average person that's listening to this podcast, I guess, um, not that I like to call anyone average, you know, you know where I'm coming from there. So they race their bikes on a weekend. How does purpose come into that? Um, you know, where do you find your purpose with regards to someone who's doing it for fun? Because I think a lot of the time sports and uh, performance sporting, it, it can be quite selfish. Um you know, you do a lot of training for your own for your own benefit, and then you go and race your bike on a weekend. Where does purpose come into that? Would you say? So, the book and purpose only isn't necessarily sport. I use some yeah. athletes within it um, because that's my background, and they're great role models and case studies. Um, but the the book, the pillars are about life. Life, yeah. And for most of us, our sport is not our purpose. Yeah. So for someone like Damien, it's his job. It's his purpose. Mm. Um, for others in the book, um, I talk about a lady called Eddie Brocklesby, who's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm going out for a drink with her tomorrow night. I should probably write off when Thursday morning. Mm. Um, and she's 80. She just had her 80th birthday. But she's wow. amazing. She does Ironman racing, still for fun in her 80s. Um, she was doing an Ironman four or five years ago and her bike saddle broke and she still had something like 40 kilometers to go and then a marathon to run and it didn't really phase her she just stood up to cycle the rest of the route and then ran the marathon 
Craig. And and that's because her purpose is to show other older people that you can be active in Mm. retirement and that will give you a brilliant life. She doesn't Mm. want to see anybody sitting around bored in retirement. Her thing is there's so much cool stuff to do. Go and live it. Make brilliant friends. Don't be lonely. And exercise is a fabulous way to do that. Mm. And so she knew that by being able to do well in her sport and finishing that Ironman, she'd be the oldest British Iron woman it would give her that platform to go and talk about these things that matter and for her to be that role model for it. So has, it does connect with sport, but it's not that her sport is the purpose. And, and it rarely, rarely is. Most of the time, the sport can be almost a channel for you to get, if you're very good at it, to get mm. the platform you want to talk about what is your purpose. Um, But other times it can be about helping you. Your purpose might be entirely unrelated, but it's it helps you deal better with things that get in the way of doing what matters to you. Mm. Um, I can only assume there'll be a a few listeners that are scratching their head thinking, what what, what is my purpose? (laughs) Purpose Um, is is really, really hard Mm. to find Um, once in however, what, seven, eight years of working with people one-to-one, one person has been able to tell me instantly what their purpose is. And they were 23-year-old, actually. That sussed it really early. Um, Mine has taken me probably six years to put into a Mm. sentence. Mm. So it's definitely things that kind of have iterations and you're thinking through and you're trying to shape it. Mm. Um, And there are different ways we help people find it. Sometimes we might actually get them to write a fake Wikipedia page for themselves. 10 years down the line, what do you want? If if someone else is writing a Wikipedia page about you, what do you want them to have seen that you've achieved and you've moved towards and you work towards? Mm. Or we might do fill a page of bullet points of what matters to you and then read through it and just use half of those, but are shaped a bit differently. And then half mm. of those again. Um, and the, so there will be lots of different things, sometimes over six or seven sessions with somebody, mm. their purpose will start to become clear and we'll start to be able to articulate it Mm. better because the ultimate goal is to be able to say in one sentence this is why i was put on this earth Mm. if you've got that everything else slots in behind it and it's a really powerful way to make decisions and to be able to focus on the things that do matter and to be able to care much less about the stuff that gets in the way that so and so's done this on strava lovely Mm. for them that's not my purpose that's not why i'm here yeah uh, moving swiftly on, I'm, I, I am very mindful of time, about, about 10 minutes left until you have to go on to your next appointment. So um, confidence and we, we've got courage as well. Um, I guess they're somewhat similar, but um, confidence and courage. Yeah, so confidence, a specifically called cultivated confidence, because mm-hmm. it's not actually arrogance. It's not that sitting on a start line or something and thinking I'm going to win this Mm. but it is knowing you've done everything you can to put yourself in the best place to do well and and that I used um an athlete called Emma Wiggs who's amazing she's a paracanoist um and I love the phrase when I when I contacted her and said I want to interview you for this on confidence she was like why I've got no (laughs) confidence and I was like "Ah, you've got eight world titles and two Olympic gold medals how do you not have Paralympic gold medals? How do you not have confidence? And she's like, I never sit on the start line knowing I'm going to win. She said, but I do sit there knowing I've spent more time in the boat, more time in the gym than anyone else. I've asked my coach more questions. I've eaten more cottage cheese than any other athlete has eaten. <laughs> and that I love to sit yeah. on the start line of whatever it is you're doing, whether it's a cycle race or a conference you're speaking at, anything to go, I've done what it, I've done all the prep. That gives me confidence. So that's really important. Yeah. Courage, I think, is slightly different. Courage, I think, is more doing things that scare us because of, sometimes often, because of the purpose. Mm-hmm. So things scare us, and we're going to do it anyway because of the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. And so I used a guy called Bobby Holland Hanton, who's an amazing athlete, stuntman. He's Chris Hemworth's um, stunt double. Um, and um, he had some amazing stories. He's done James Bond stuff. So he had brilliant stories about 
how that we can all learn from about how we become more courageous and the process you go through. Um, but I think there are lots of everybody knows individual stories of when they've been courageous themselves. And it's what would have been really courageous in that race where you had a puncture. The real courage would have been to go, I know I might not do very well and I'm going to finish anyway. Mm. And those are the bits that we can reflect on where we haven't been as courageous as we would have liked to go next time I'm going to do this. Mm. And that's where you then start to grow your courage. And actually sometimes as well, you know, kind of linking it with confidence there. You mentioned that example about the, uh, the rower who um, went in with, the, with, with no confidence, but knew that she'd done the right things in practice. Sometimes I've gone into races where, I know that I'm racing against who I'm racing against people who have had better time practicing and they are at a better standard than I am. But I've also got the courage to do that race, knowing that I can still outperform that individual if I play my cards right kind of thing. And and if more so in bunch racing, I get, I guess, where if I if I play my cards right, if I race that race well, if I race within my own, how I know I can race, I've, I've got the courage to know that I can still outperform that individual. Um, so that's kind of a, a different spin on it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, process. Um, Wiki it's, says it's a series of actions or steps taken in order to achieve a particular end. Yeah, that makes sense. Um it feels like a very dull one and it feels like the one you constantly get lectured on by focus on the process, not on the outcome. Mm. It's so, so important. Um, most of the athletes I work with come to me for performance anxiety and um, we work a huge amount then on their threat systems. Outcomes are what causes us to feel threat the fear of what an outcome might do, whether that's somebody laughing at us, feeling embarrassed, failing, have feeling like we've wasted our time working towards something. When we focus on processes, and particularly when we go into a race and we focus on inputs, we do so much better. Mm. And so it feels quite counterintuitive um, of don't focus on the output, but you are, I am sure, you are more likely to, to win a race if you don't focus on trying to win. If you focus on trying to do each individual element of input brilliantly, you will do really, really well mm. because you're doing all the pillars that it takes in order to do well. Mm. As soon as you start thinking about outcome, your threat system is triggered. You have strong physiological responses. Your brain is taken up by all the what ifs and the imagining all the scenarios that are going to go catastrophically um, and you can't perform very well. So while it's not the most exciting concept, it's probably one of the most important ones. And it's tiring as well uh, when you're constantly focusing on the, the result. It's incredibly fatiguing. <laughs> like yeah. The amount of times that I've been like so ang anxious because I should, I should win, quote unquote, should win this race compared to who I'm racing against. And yeah. all day I'm thinking about that and then the what ifs. Then, you know, I get to the race and I'm exhausted because... Yeah. You know, it's it's very stimulating all all those thoughts. Totally. Um, optimism. Um yeah, this was the last one I actually put in. Um but when I started researching it, it was so powerful. I'm not talking about kind of the toxic positivity of we must be totally over the top optimistic on everything. It's very pragmatic optimism. Um, and, and having some reality in there. But when there is something about that, when we look for the good stuff and when we expect good things to happen, we tend to do more of what it takes to make them happen. Mm -hmm. And so they are more likely to happen. So I'm, I'm totally not into the whole kind of manifesting stuff I see online. Um, but I do think if, if we expect the good stuff, and we then go away and do the work to make that happen, we achieve much more than if we're constantly looking on the negative side. And that means we then don't do, we make excuses. We don't do what it takes to get us to, to achieve things. So I think optimism is really important. Mm. 
Uh, we've talked a little bit about grat. There's two more left on on these this ten. Um, we've talked a little bit about gratitude initially. Um, so lastly, then um, internal insight. Love this one. When I wrote my first book, it was called Performing Under Pressure, and it's for coaches and trainee sports psychs. It was the book I wish I'd had when I was training as a sports psych. So it's nine tech or nine reasons people tend to go and see a sports psych, like handling difficult situations, handling setbacks, not being confident enough, not knowing how to push themselves harder. And then 64 strategies that you can then use, psych strategies in order to be able to do all of those elements. And when I was looking at the 64 strategies and I was trying to categorize them, I was like, something is missing. And I was like, it's self-awareness. Actually, at the core of sports psychology, the core of ourselves is self-awareness. Mm. When we are more self-aware, we can then use whatever skills or techniques there are in the best way for us. And so we really need that internal insight in order to be able to perform better. And I, I really wanted to talk to Sarah Pasco about that. And as a comedian, her job, as, especially as an observational comedian, she's like, she was talking about how she just constantly has to look around herself and around her as to what's funny. But it really makes you analyze in a very different way. And she had some fascinating stories about how to be more self-aware and but also not to get tied up in who you are too much to know your own biases and she had a lovely story about she was doing edinburgh festival and so that's that's a big deal as a comedian doing your first edinburgh it was brilliant and she had a, an hour-long show and 20 minutes into the show a woman stood up really quickly ran down the stairs and slammed the door behind her and instantly her brain with her internal biases had gone to I'm a rubbish comedian. Mm. She hates me. I should give up now. The whole thing. So she was doing the rest of the show, but with her mind half on, I'm rubbish. I'm useless. I should quit. And obviously didn't enjoy it because all that stuff's going on. I may not have given the best performance. She said she got home. She looked through her emails and she had an email from a lady saying, I was at your show tonight. It was brilliant. I'm so sorry. I think I'm pregnant. I had to run out to throw up, didn't want to throw up in the theatre. Wow. I snuck back in through the door quietly to be able to watch the rest of your show. And I'm really sorry if I distracted you in any way. <laughs> she said, what an eye opening thing that her bias was. This happened. I must be rubbish. And then she got the other side of the story. A woman had pregnancy sickness and <laughs> had to leave. So she didn't make a mess and loved it. And, and how nice for that lady to email and explain. I know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so, so beautiful to share that with her so that, um, that she really benefited from mm. it. But mm. for all of us to kind of really be able to see, and I will often do this a lot with athletes in sessions, I was like, I know it feels that way to you and that's your perception of this situation. Let's play devil's advocate. What could be the other side? Mm. Why might, I don't know, your coach not be seeming like they're feeding into you in the same way they used to? And then they could come up with, oh, well, they are actually on paternity leave. Right. So they haven't had any sleep for three weeks. Mm -hmm. They're trying to do far too much stuff. And they're still trying to be a really good coach, but they can't give you the same amount that they did. There'll be a light mob moment of, oh, yeah. And so that can be really, really helpful to force ourselves to look inside ourselves of what biases, what, what values do we hold dear that might be violated by somebody doing this? And, and what might really be going on behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, so I found that one really helpful. Josie, um, we're going to have to wrap things up. Um, I, I, I really, really must thank you for coming on the podcast. Um, it's been, it's, it's been one of those frustrating times for me because we've scratched the surface on a couple of little things, but it's, it's a conversation that could last multiple hours and there's many different routes we could go down. Um, for anyone listening that um, wants to buy your book, um, where is this? Is audio only, isn't it? So audible. No, oh, is no it not? so it is. It is on audible. But um, last year we bought it out as a physical copy. 
Okay. Um, because and we put some worksheets and things in there as well wow. so that you can actually do much more of the kind of things that are suggested and um, so you can buy it from amazon waterstones any Brilliant. of the big bookshops and it's called the 10 pillars of success yeah so yeah it's it's something that i again uh I've, I've actually purchased it about two days ago it's not arrived yet um but i'm looking forward to giving it a good read um but um but no that's been really really insightful um and I must say, you know, one of the, the traits of someone like yourself and being a sports psychologist, I think you naturally you're brilliant at conversation. So the conversation flows really, really well. And you seem to have a good, uh, good kind of um, understanding of each other. So um, it seems like in, in writing, read, writing this book, you've had some amazing conversations with all sorts of different people. So I'm sure it was a really enjoyable process for you. Um, it's lovely. And you learned a lot from it um but uh where can people find you um whether you, about your book or about the services that you provide um so i've got a website it's called performanceinmind.co.uk um and there's a section on there about services but there's also a section on there called performance zone and there's lots of worksheets and tools and things you can download and use fantastic and obviously i'll put the links in the show notes <laughs> Thank you very much, Josie. Yeah. I really appreciate your time and have a brilliant rest of the day. You too. Thank you. Bye.